standard stuff that you have to ask and one of the one of the standard things is where were you when you found out who told you and how did you feel oh okay um, on I'm, any of them you could talk about the Oscar you could talk about any of them okay um, well when I found out I won a Golden Globe I was at my home in gym clothes <laughs> and that was honestly the most comfortable way to um, win an award <laughs> um, the SAG nomination was actually a very cool week. I was hosting Saturday Night Live. And thank you. You all see her do that. It was so fun. It was busy beyond. It was so fun and so wild and terrifying. Um, what was terrifying about it? Because it, in my brain, I was like, these people, they do this every week. They are so great at sketch comedy. And I don't know if there are moments where I'm just like, I'm not that funny. So I need to work really hard so I don't ruin their show. Uh, so that's what I did. I just worked really hard so I didn't ruin the show. You, you didn't ruin the show. You elevated it. Thank you. I appreciate that. But I was, um, I was, I got the opportunity to sleep in <laughs> the one day. And that's when I found out about Sagnom and uh, the Oscar nom. I hadn't slept at all. I'm normally very chill, but for some odd reason I couldn't sleep. Uh, and my best friend, who was also my prom date, arrived at my apartment, and he was like, wow, in all the years I've known you, you are not well. <laughs> so <laughs> we're gonna go for a walk. We're not, we are not going to get coffee. You don't need any. We're gonna go for a walk. And we were on the East River when I got a phone call uh, from my team. and. We were by the highway, so there were so many cars just passing by. So I answer the phone and I hear nothing. I just see faces and they're all very happy. And I'm reading lips and I was like, Oscar nominated! And I scared all the runners that were running by me. It was, it was a classic, iconic New York moment. <laughs> it's really extraordinary. And one of the things we, had, we were talking together here earlier and uh, I was talking about how 
how hard you have worked. And I don't mean that in, in any other way other than I know you're devoted to what, to what you do. Um, can you talk a little bit about the audition for West Side Story? Oh my. Um, and were you nervous? <laughs> yeah. Well, yes. Um, you know, I auditioned. I was I was working on Broadway at the time. I was playing Disco Donna Summer in the Donna Summer. Thank you, thank you, my friend. Um, and that was a really challenging show. Uh, it was really like my first foray. I know. Being a leading lady, you saw it. She she comes to most things that I'm in. It makes me really happy. Um, and. Uh, Cindy Tolan called one night and asked me if I'd come in the next day at like 10.30. Mind you, this is after the show. And I was like, okay, well, where am I going? She's like, Brooklyn. And I was like, Cindy, Brooklyn? <laughs> <laughs> um, and then she was like, okay, but just come and you'll sing and dance and then you'll read. And so I took one look at the sides and I called her back and I was like, mm, please don't make me do that. <laughs> Because why? Why were well? Tony Kushner adapted our screenplay from the original author Lawrence text, and and m most of you would know Tony a lot from his theater stuff, Angels right. in Angels America, America and, yeah. which changed my life. Like I yeah. am such a devotee yeah. of the Kushner, and <laughs> I took one look at those sides, and they were expanded. Like it's not. It was nothing I'd ever read in regards to West Side Story, and it was very wordy. And I was like, there's no way in the world I'm gonna be prepared for this. And I was just like, I'm a woman of color. I can't walk in and just wing it. Like, that's not what we're doing here. And on the off chance that Steven Spielberg sees my tape, I would like it to be good. <laughs> so I just said, I was like, I would really love to sing and dance for you tomorrow, but I would really like to, if you're interested in what I do, I'd love to just come back. She was like, don't worry about it, I got you. Just come, just come. So I oi. got there that day. Oi, it's not done. Like, <laughs> oi, oi, that was the beginning. Just, just, just come, we'll, just we'll come. fix it. It'll be fine, I'll, I'll fix it, I'll fix it, I'll fix it. Okay, so I get there, I'm warming up. I made it to Brooklyn, thank God. And <laughs> I get there and everybody's really on edge. And there are lots of jets and sharks and a few women who I recognize and they're auditioning for Anita, da, 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 da. So I learned the dance, la, 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 la. Justin Peck is amazing and incredible and of the dance world. And like, I, I just was such a fan already. Um, learned the choreography and then we go into the room to like show it off to what I just assume is, you know, camera and accompanist. Mm, how about, no, how about all the producers and Steven Spielberg? Sound like a good idea? Um, and you didn't know that until nope, walked into not the room. a clue. Oh just, my word. It was like the craziest, what cold read scenario sort of thing, dance, dance cold dance, um, my version of a cold dance. And I was like, ooh, I literally said I wasn't gonna read today. Am I gonna stick with to that choice? And I said, you know what, Ariana, you are. So I went in and I danced and he liked the way I danced. And he said, okay, would you sing? And I was like, I'd love to sing for you. And so I said- What did you sing? Um, I had to do a portion of America and Tony Kushner was my Bernardo because there were no Bernardos present. That day. Um, so that was fun. Um, and and then he said, "I love the way you sing. Oh my gosh, where did you come from?" And I was like, <laughs> "Broadway." Um, <laughs> and, um, many shows. Many, on Broadway. many, many shows. Very, very, very blessed. Uh, six Broadway credits to my name at the time. And uh, yeah, it was really great. I think Teddy Brunetti's here somewhere. He was in, we did a Bronx Tale together. Hi, my man. Thank you for being here. Love you. Um, but it was wild. Anyways, the dreaded moment came and he was like, so will you read? And I was like, nope. And uh, you actually said I no? actually said nope. And I was giggling and smiling because that's how I handle you know, an anxiety attack or stress or an aneurysm. One of them. <laughs> and he said, excuse me. And Cindy Dolan, thank God, a blessed cast casting director who actually had my back. So grateful. It was like, no, 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 no. Stephen, we talked about her. She's starring on Broadway. She literally just wanted to be prepared. And he said, okay, so you're not going to read today. And I was like, no, sir. <laughs> and he said, but will you come back? And I said, I would be honored. 
And so for the next week, he brought me back and that led to a secondary callback and then I got the job while I was sitting in a nail salon and that was pretty <laughs> iconic. You were, you were in very unusual places when you hear good news. <laughs> yeah. In the highway. You were, you were having your nails done? I was. I was having um, my gels removed because I felt like I, I had done the matinee and I felt like there was a lady in the front row who did nothing but stare at my undone nails the entire time. <laughs> And I was like, I will not be shamed. <laughs> One more show. <laughs> and, did, and did was it who was it Stephen that called you? Well, I, I saw with foils because when you get gels removed, you got foils on your nails. Um, so I was sitting there and I was like, that's an eight one eight number. Excuse me, ma'am, can you help me answer this phone call? I think I should take this. And she was like, okay. And so I like get the phone, I'm like, hello. It's like, hi, this is so and so from Steven's office. I'm going to transfer you. He's on a plane. So if the call drops, he'll call you right back. I can't like, have okay. I'm having my nails done. I was like, could you imagine? I was like, I've already told this man no once. So maybe I'll yeah, right. do that. Not a, not, a good, not a good path. Not a good look. That's good. Right. Um, it, and it was a little choppy, but I could hear him, and he was like, hello, you know, because he's shouting, he's on a plane. <laughs> Hi, Ariana, da, 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 da. he said some nice things and some nice things, and I was like, what's happening right now? And he finally got to the part where he was like, I just wanted to say or ask you if you would be my Anita. And I remember it so clearly because it was the difference for me, the difference in that, it was an ask. He didn't tell me that I was going to be Anita. He asked me if I would be. And it felt like an invitation to actually collaborate. And that was really special to me. I also, I didn't mention this part of the story, but in that first like um, audition where I said no, before I left the room, he asked me if there was anything else that I wanted to share about the material or my thoughts or anything. And I said, you know, there's just one thing. I was like, well, I'm Afro-Latina. I'm a black woman. So if you are considering me for this part, you should also know that I would be the darkest skinned woman to do this on screen. And Afro-Latinas were very real. And if you want to cast me, I would encourage you to consider that in the context of your script and your film. And if you don't want to do that, then you shouldn't cast me. And it was very- You said you shouldn't cast me. Yeah, I did. Nobody does that. <laughs> I mean, I must have just like woken up and eaten my Wheaties because these things just kept falling out of my mouth and I couldn't stop myself. Uh, but I, I, I have no regrets, not just because it's all gone so well, but because it was, I don't know, it was, it was my truth. It is my truth. Nothing about it has changed. And I was just really excited that someone like him could hear me. What did he say to you when you said that? Oh, he sort of stared at me like I had five heads and then he said, <laughs> And probably, wow. do you know what an Afro-Latina is? No, Just, I'm not going to say that part about it. <laughs> right. But um, he literally just sort of looked at me. He was like, wow, OK, absolutely. And then he turned to Tony Kushner. And Tony was like, yes, absolutely. And I hadn't thought about that. But the next time that I saw them, there were adapted scenes. And I was very proud of that because it sort of felt like I was already reflected in the work. Um, and, and I also knew, because sometimes that happens in the context of audition processes, you'll say things and then suddenly they wind up in the scripts and you don't get the job. <laughs> um, but for me, I was like, even if I don't get this job, if it goes this way, if it's another Afro-Latina, the work will reflect them. They will be seen in it. And that was the point of it, because that's, it, to be seen is an honor. <laughs> and we're not seen all the time, you know? So Right, and yeah. so how was that collaboration with them? Did that continue? Yeah, that was the whole process. And that was what was cool about the audition process is that it was indicative of everything else we experienced. If I ever had a thought or a, an inclination, there was a day we were doing the Lieutenant Shrank scene mm -hmm. where he comes to really interrogate Maria. Um, and I had read the, the scene and I was like, there's something here, but it's not on the page. And then I was taking sewing lessons on that very vintage Singer sewing machine. Mm -hmm. And 
I heard that sound. You push the pedal and it just is like Rah! And in my brain, I was like, that's the sound. So I said to Steven on the day that we were gonna shoot this, I was like, I have an idea, I'm gonna try something. He was like, okay, yeah. go for it. <laughs> and so Corey sang his lines and I just put my foot on that pedal and I let it go. And Steven looked at me like, again, like I had five heads and then he realized what I was doing. And he said, ah, I have to change the shots. <laughs> and I was like, you get me, you see what I'm doing. And it was, just, those were really exciting moments. Cause I was like, oh my God, we're creating, we're doing this together. And that's really what it was whether it was moments like that or working on the script while we were rehearsing and not just it wasn't just about him asking me my opinion he asked everyone their opinion our entire cast especially our latinos because yes i was going to say there's a yeah all of the, the i believe we have 32 <coughs> dan Latine, uh, yeah dancers dancers making their on-screen debuts and also when's the last time you've seen that many beautiful hispanics on the screen <laughs> like that you know, we, you, we can say many, many things about representation in this industry, but that doesn't happen every day. And we've been really lucky to have s several films that reflect us in many ways. And that is exciting to me because there's a long way to go, but that steps in the right direction and we still got to take steps. Um, but ooh, I really, I really appreciate that you're acknowledging what has been done and what else yes. has to be. Yeah. What else has to be done? So when you were in the process of, of all that collaboration, that was something that continued all the way to the to the, the very, very end. end. The very mm -hmm. end. And in every facet, like whether it was music or or choreography, Justin was very collaborative. Um, what does that mean with a choreographer? Yeah. Usually they have their very distinctive ideas and they come in and they say, this is what we're gonna do. You know, and you're going to do a tour jeté here, and then did you also say no to that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like <laughs> uh, uh, You know what I did say? I was like, you know, I just feel like we could play to my strengths. <laughs> I did say that, and uh, and what do you can? What do you? So I. Your strengths? Well, given the time period, and at that point, I had, I had seen what Paul Taswell had up his sleeves for these gorgeous costumes. I was like, great, those skirts are going to be really heavy. So how do we show them off? And I was like, she needs to twirl. She needs to turn. Yeah. So I was like, I, I can turn, so let me do that. Um, and I was like, let's play. For some odd reason, I was just like, let's keep playing with circles. Like, it's all about circles and spheres. And... And then uh, Justin was very interested in, he watched, you know, countless videos of the Mambo from like, mm. whether it was the Mambo like performed by white folks or performed by Latine people um, at the time, Puerto Rican people at the time. And so you have this interesting hybrid of Dance at the Gym on screen because it's actually, I would love to be able to sit here as a dancer and say that it's completely derivative from Hispanic culture. I don't actually believe that. But what it does have is our our spice and our personality on choreography that is recreating its own language. In the same way that Jerry Robbins and Peter Gennaro created a language, a language that the Broadway community and the musical theater community has built upon. Justin Peck was charged with the challenge of doing that for a new generation, and that's what we have on the screen. So it's um, it's a beautiful hybrid, and that's what's hap that's what's happening throughout this film in context of the choreography. I think. Right. So you have a lot of Broadway people. I mean, Paul yeah. Caswell. Uh, is... Yeah, we did Hamilton together. He designed Hamilton. That's that's right, and he designed a play that I did called Lombardi. That's right. And so. You have a lot of these Broadway people that are there. Did that feel comforting to you? Did that feel like you were with your people? I mean, you've done so many Broadway shows. Yeah. I mean, since 2011. I mean, you are you have this sort of your own particular legacy. And here you have all of these other people who have come from another aspect of your work. 
just talk a little bit about that, about how you were surrounded by other people from Broadway as well, you know, all of your dancers. And yeah. So, so no, it what, felt like home, you know, it felt like home. Yes, we were making a major studio film. Right. But it was honestly like going to theater camp every day. You know, but my camp counselors were Steven Spielberg and Tony Kushner. You know, so but it was it was oddly really comforting, and it's something I'm super excited about because it's not every day that theater talent is given the opportunity to work on screen in this right. way. It's really really rare. I mm -hmm. I have started talking about it because who knew I'd have an opinion on anything. <laughs> but, um, I don't feel like Hollywood's been in the business of making stars. Say more about that. Well, I mean, if you look at old Hollywood, right, there was a time where these studios, like, Judy Garland was not a name until she was a name. Like, there's, like, Fred Astaire was not a name until he was made a name. And I feel like there was a time when, well, I'm going to say something else. There was a time where you weren't working in Hollywood if you were not a triple threat. If you couldn't sing, dance, and act at the same time, you weren't getting a job. And yes, that's yet yeah, 1950s. And thank you for clapping, because I do appreciate that. But it's, um, it's been interesting. When I got to New York, um, for me... You mean from North Carolina? From North Carolina. Yeah, I moved when I was 19 from North Carolina. And... When I got there, it's not that triple threats were dying out, but we were not the, the ask, we were not the commodity. We, the park and bark was prevailing, to be perfectly frank. Right. <laughs> well, and that's a very specific skill set too, but being asked to sing and dance at the same time was not what was being asked of folks. And if you did have that skill set, you were in the ensemble or you were the understudy. And there's nothing wrong with that. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. It just meant that when I first got there, you weren't really given the opportunity to audition to be a leading lady. And I realized that very quickly. But I also... And wanted, how did you relate to that? Well, I mean... What, how, did you, how did you get yourself to a different place? How did, you, how did you hold that? How did you deal with that emotionally? Because that's tough. Yes, I don't, I mean... Not being seen. I mean, what you've been talking a lot about is about being seen. And you're saying you weren't being seen. Oh, no, I didn't feel seen. I, I, when I got there, I was very lucky. My first job was with Andy Blankenbuehler, and he gave me a really great opportunity to play, to create a character for a musical that did sing, dance, and act. She had great step out moments. It was a really wonderful learning experience. But then from that moment, or after that moment, it took me another six or seven years before I could really change casting directors' minds about my talent. Because I was only offered an audition for roles that were like featured roles, but you were in the ensemble, carrying the ensemble, in specifically dance-based shows. It was actually very hard for me to get an audition for anything that was not dance-based. Um, and it took, it was hard, I'm not going to lie, it was really, really hard. And But I, I was very committed to changing people's minds, and that meant I had to train. And so I got my happy ass in vocal lessons and I took the acting classes, and honestly, I was not very good for a long time. And I, when I did get opportunities to audition, sometimes they didn't go great, but I fell on my face and then I'd try again. I learned from it every time, and I took the feedback. Um, and then around the time that I was doing Hamilton, I had sustained several injuries during the context of that, my time on that show. Yeah neck injuries and shoulder injuries that change the way that I dance and move. In fact, I don't dance the way that I used to anymore. I physically cannot. And so I had to change my tactic and figure out how to, how I could get a different kind of work. And that meant I had to become a better actor. And Where do you think you get this kind of resilience? My Where mom. Where you, your mom. My mom. 
<laughs> she's a she she raised me as a single parent, right? Yeah, we well we raised each other. She's also a public school teacher in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, she's great. Public school teachers, by the way, are angels, absolute angels, and they're not paid enough. Um, and especially the arts teachers. <laughs> it's always the first to get cut. It's really disappointing. Um, but I was raised by a very strong woman who taught me to know my mind and work really, really hard to speak up for myself, but to know that you're not owed anything. And if you want to right. succeed at something, then it's your job to learn everything you can about that thing or that subject and to be knowledgeable, to not just rely on your talent. And so that's what I did. Even when I got to New York, I didn't go to, I didn't go to college for, for any of this, you know? Um, but I believe in education. So I had to figure out how to educate myself. So I watched every YouTube video I could find, a lot of, a lot of actor studio. Um, and then I just started watching videos and studying them, not enjoying them. So that was a way that I could educate myself. I remember watching you. Like I want, literally, I went through and I watched everything that you were in, whether it was Law and Order or your films that you made in the 80s that are now on YouTube, thank God, because I learned a lot from them. Many of them you helped produce. You made your own work in a time that they weren't making work for you. Yeah. Exactly. Badass. That's how it gets done. <laughs> you know? And I took notes. But it, it's an interesting yeah. dynamic that we're talking about because, you know, there are, a lot, of course, a lot of, um, certainly people in the business, a lot of actors here, and we're talking about the value of what you have to do. Yeah. That it doesn't just happen for you. It, it, it takes diligence and perseverance and a tremendous amount of really hard work. And you are, and in this particular piece, you're living part of a legacy. I mean, you're with Rita Moreno, and then you're following in the footsteps of all these other Marias. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm Anita. sorry, uh, Anita's your, and so in creating your own Anita, how do you, how do you take this resilience that you have and this understanding and be the triple threat that you are in this movie in that, in that way? I mean, Debbie Allen did it yeah. too. Debbie, Cheetah, um, Nancy Tegan um, Yeah, I mean, there's... <laughs> But yours is distinctive. Do you think what you went through, that some of the stuff you were just talking about, do you think that is what you drew on to change, to continue the legacy, but to change it and make it yours, completely yours? That's a really good question. I hadn't thought about it that way. Um, certainly, there are parts of my journey that were very useful, a lot of pain. Rejection's a very powerful motivator. Um, rejection in many forms, rejection by your family, um, rejection by communities. You know, I have many personal ties to this story. I'm a queer Afro-Latina. <laughs> <laughs> so that was its own implication, thank you. But I'm, I'm out and proud and have been for a very long time. And but I also am someone who grew up, uh, you know, my mother's white, and I was raised by the white side of my family. And when you are the only person who looks like this in your community, you, you, you don't see yourself reflected, and sometimes you don't feel like you have allies, and you will never be white enough. In certain circles, I'm still not black enough. That's a real lived experience that I have, and I'm, you know, too Latin enough? I mean, I think so now. <laughs> I will tell you this, though. When I, um... But you know what I mean. Yes, it's of like, course. Is, that, is, no, there, is was... there seeing happening? Yes. Yeah. Ab absolutely. The shit of it is, pardon my French. Um, when I was a kid, because I didn't have access to my culture, I didn't, I, in, I just... I wrote this story in my head that 
that the Hispanic community didn't want me. Literally, because I, I, I didn't speak Spanish growing up and where I did, I grew up in a river town, um, New Bern, North Carolina, and we had many immigrant communities that formed there, but they predominantly spoke Spanish and because I didn't speak Spanish, I couldn't find ways to connect with them. And I was also having trouble connecting with, with other kids. Um, actually, I connected best with, folk, with young people who loved the arts. Right. That was my great. So the connector. dancing was was your was way in. That was yeah. my way in. It always has been, and I guess growing up, I struggled with acceptance on many many levels. This character struggles with acceptance. You hear it talked about in a few different scenes. You see how people react to her. Many different uh, belong to both communities. Um, she's also an ambitious woman, and sometimes ambition is off putting. And that creates problems between women. Mm -hmm. So I identify with her in that way. Um, I think you asked specifically or referenced the legacy of it. There is a lot of legacy. This was a scary job to take on because I, there is 60 years of legacy that didn't necessarily belong to me, but now is mine as well. And I'm very proud of that. Um, but it was hard because I wasn't sure when I even first auditioned if there would be space for a new interpretation of an Anita. But I believe in I believe in revivals, and I believe in reinterpretations and reimaginations, whichever whichever word you like, of classics because that's how we tell these stories for new generations. It's like nobody sits here. I'm on a soapbox, but go with me. Nobody sits here and complains about how many different productions of Macbeth we have, or Hamlet. Nobody's complaining about doing Shakespeare over and over and over again with different concepts. Why? Because they're classic. Because the stories and the themes are universal and we need to receive them. To me, that's my opinion of it. So my question became, then why can't we reimagine and reinterpret West Side Story? Because its themes, its source material is Romeo and Juliet, and its themes are just as important, potentially more now than they were in 1961 when the Robert Weiss film came out. Yeah. So that's why I was like, all right, if we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this. And I believe in doing things that scare you every day. So that's part of why I did it. The, um, the story, yeah. Like you said, the storytelling of this is that the nature of this story is eternal. Yeah. What is it that makes this eternal? What is it that we are so compelled by? What is it that you're curious about, about this film that tells us something about us and our culture and our society now? That's a big, That's a fancy big. question. It is, <laughs> Judith. Judith said I came with the big guns tonight. <laughs> um, she said, I don't care that it's past my bedtime. We're going to ask the question. Um, oh, my. I suppose this story is about group, two groups of people who actually have more in common than they have different. That was not eloquent, but I think you get my no, point. I, I, I know exactly what you're saying. It's what's happening in our country yeah. right now. That's right. Yeah. I was so fascinated that if these two groups of people would just actually sit down and talk to each other, there'd be a lot less needless killing and needless violence and needless death. Like, none of that actually needed to happen. There was a version of the wor world where Anita and Bernardo got to live in a bigger apartment and have those six kids and maybe even go back to Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. There's a version of the world where, you know, maybe Tony actually does become a better, a better man and maybe he takes over Docs and like continues Valentina's legacy. Things could have been a lot different if we just talked. We don't talk in this country anymore. And when we do talk, it's typically just to hear ourselves speak and yeah. not actually receive. 
and you see some of these characters doing the same thing. Yeah. Um, I think in regards to Anita, I was really curious about her expressions of grief because I think especially, well, women in general and women of color especially are thought to be strong. And strength is a beautiful thing, but sometimes strength comes through in wild emotion. And just because you cry, it doesn't mean that you're weak. And I didn't actually feel in any incarnation of West Side Story I'd ever seen that the full breadth of Anita's grief was actually explored. And I wanted, if I was going to do it, I wanted it to be hideous and really hard to watch. And at least for me, I don't actually like to watch it. Um, but I'm very proud of it because I think women really go through that. Yeah. Do you think you'll ever feel comfortable watching it? No. Okay, good. That's good. I'm glad. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I didn't make it to watch it. I made it for other people to watch it and think about well, and it. They, and, they, and they obviously did and, and loved it. Um, just talk a little bit about your relationship with Rita Moreno. Oh, you know, I'm so grateful to her. She opened, just by being, by being who she is, she's opened so many doors for so many of us. Um, we had a rocky start because I was just a ball of anxiety and quite frankly, I didn't really know what to say. <laughs> um, but she was really graceful with me and this is gonna sound odd, but she didn't impede my process in any way. Like she was always available and really supportive and she'd make me laugh if she thought I was being too serious. Yeah. Um, but she let me have a process. And I think sometimes that's not what happens when someone has such ownership over a character. I mean, I actually don't know if any, there are two actresses who have ever really gone through a process like this. Like, I, I think it's probably extremely rare that you have two Anitas on the same set. Um, I know it was challenging for her. It was challenging for me in different ways just because I just so badly, I mean, I enjoy being liked. I would prefer being liked just to not. Um, but I, I love her. I admire her, I really wanted her to like what I was doing, but I also knew that if she didn't, it wasn't going to impact the work, because the work's the work. And I'm, what I can tell you is that we have the greatest relationship because she supported me and allowed me to thrive. And, we, and she thrived on our set and we did it side by side. There was never, I'm gonna stand in front of you or get get in the way. It was really, she became a partner and a colleague. And that was really nice because I can tell you something else that's not what happens sometimes in generational relationships. So that's, that's right. And her grace and your grace made all of that possible. I mean, we're talking about so many different aspects of this film while we're also talking about so many aspects of you. And I just want to go back for a minute and just touch on the stuff that you and I both have a, um, a long history of our advocacy for the LGBTQIA plus community. And I wanted to know how that came about for you, how you have been there to support the community in the way that you have. Oh, well. I would try and keep it brief, but there's nothing like brief about that subject. I know, and that's why I, I mean, I guess so many people want to go home, or I'm just sitting here having a conversation oh, with my friend. Thank you for being here. Yeah, I have to that. Thank you for being here. Um, you know, I when I first moved to this city and um, was working on Broadway, I, you know, discovered Broadway Cares. Yeah, Broadway Cares Equity Fights AIDS, and they. Um, Tom Viola and, and, and some other representatives of the organization came and were speaking about what 
they do and how they advocate for folks not only living with but thriving with HIV and AIDS and how they support people in need in the community and whatnot. And they were doing something called Broadway Bears. And I was like, well, I don't know what that is, but it sounds like a great idea to me. <laughs> My grandfather wasn't as thrilled about that as I told you. Um, but I participated that year, and that was a year that they were, there was an education component to the experience, and they were playing a documentary that you actually showed up and gave a talk back at. Talk back at. The name of the documentary escapes me, but I will never forget watching How to Survive a Plague. How to Survive a Plague. And I just was so moved because I had no idea. I never learned about it in school. I didn't, I learned about the, you know, the Black Plague. I was like, but this was a plague for the modern age. And I was, I could, I just couldn't believe that that, that happened and no one did anything. And that was also a moment in my life where I was coming to terms with my own sexuality. And I was like, I'm, I want to be involved. I want to, you know, use my voice, whatever it's worth. And so I fundraised for every, <laughs> every event that I could. And then when the prom came along, um, my co-star and I, Joellen Pellman, I just think she's a doll. And it, it was her first job, this wonderfully beautiful queer young woman. And um, for the for extraordinary Ryan Murphy. Ryan Murphy, right. like also playing Alyssa Green in, for that particular project with Ryan Murphy, like that was so important to me because no Tino Shade, Ryan Murphy has given the LGBTQAI plus community more job opportunities than any other director, producer, period, in this industry in the last decade. And that's monumental to me. So when the film was gonna come out, I was like, this feels like an opportunity, we should do something. And so we called Ryan and Joellen was like, tell him what your idea was. And I was like, well, it's our idea now. And <laughs> I was like, I want to create something. Like, we want to do like a website or something that connects young people or anybody who watches our film to organizations that can help them along their journey with identity. This isn't about recreating the wheel because these these orgs are doing it already. And not both of us agreed, neither one of us really knew they existed when we were growing up. So that's why we created the Unruly Hearts Initiative and in our first year, it's a great website. You should check it out. We have a really hearts initiative .org. Um, And uh, we raise money when we can. Uh, in our first year, for these organizations, our 2021 partners were Point Foundation, Covenant House, and Trevor Project. Um, and as we've seen, especially in the last six months, you know, suicide rates are going up. So if, if you can't support the Trevor Project, please consider doing so. Um, but in our first year, we raised $140,000. Well, in Covenant House, you've got the kids on the street. Yeah, sexually trafficked yeah. And, yeah. and homeless youth. Um, so we're, we're trying to help, help young people in any way that we can. Housing solutions, um, uh, higher education access, and... Um, from Point Foundation. From Point Foundation. Yeah. <laughs> As you can see, <laughs> um, Point Foundation and then Trevor Project Suicide Prevention. Um, but there are many, many organizations that are highlighted on the website, and you can find anything you need for parents as well, because that's important too. Yeah, your your devotion to that, your dedication, your perseverance toward the things that you are of service about is every bit as powerful as your dedication and your perseverance to your work. No, you bet, you bet. You have other work that you've done since this. Can you just give everybody a little taste of what that is? Yeah, well, um, you know what's odd? Just like a point of order. I made West Side Story, and then I made The Prom, and then I made Shmiga Dude. And, and if you haven't seen Shmiga Dude, it's cute. Uh, but kid you not, both of those projects came out before West Side Story. Wild. Um, but I, I had the opportunity to make a really cool six-hander. It's a, a sci-fi thriller directed by Gabriella Calvert-Waite called ISS. Um, we, we shot it during the pandemic. 
um, in Wilmington, North Carolina, where I was born. So that was a really cool opportunity. And Gabby's one hell of a filmmaker, I think. Um, she brought you Blackfish and Our Friend most recently and then and where where are we going to see that when can we see it is that's it such a good question i don't know okay, but when i do check out my instagram because i'll talk about it <laughs> and then matthew vaughn's argyle um he he's responsible for the kingsman um he makes very fun action flicks but bryce dallas howard uh, henry cavill john cena Catherine o'hara brian cranston and the great samuel l jackson oh. and myself are in that film, and I believe that's a Christmas movie, and I hope you'll enjoy that when it comes to light. I can't imagine anything that you would do that we would not absolutely love, adore, and enjoy. And I believe that this is only the beginning for you in this particular realm, in this particular field. This is the beginning. And when I look back and, and when I see how young you are and when I look back at your, your stage trajectory and your bio and all the things that you have done, I just cannot imagine that you will not be absolutely flying through the world now. And particularly, I really want to acknowledge you for how hard you work, not just on your work and what you bring to the work, but how hard you work on yourself, because I know you do, and I know that it's reflected, and that's what's gonna bring everybody to stand for you for the continuation of everything that you're gonna do in your life, and I love you.